بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم الحمد لله um, Just a, a quick note regarding what happened yesterday, last night in Nice, France of course, it goes without saying, Muslims don't need to condemn everything. We don't have to prove that we're not guilty, and we don't have to apologize for something that we didn't do. Nevertheless, um, because the way the media frames things and propaganda works, like one of the Nazi uh, propagandists did back in uh, World War II, the strategy is the same. If you tell a lie enough times, people will believe it, even if it's not true. So how do you as Muslims, how do we as Muslims generally combat that? We have to be out there more than visible, more than we're visible. In a sense that it's not enough for us to just be seen as Muslims on the street. You have to interact with non-Muslims. You have to invite them to your home. You have to go to their occasions. You have to show that you're together as human beings in this. That way, should anything happen and they see something in the news, immediately in their mind they think, well, I know Abdul Qadir is not like this. I know Muna is not like that. I hang out with Fatma all the time and she doesn't do this. And so you can combat it by that way. You have to be active with non-Muslims and engaging with them more than just come to the masjid so that we can do da'wah to you. You don't have to convert people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells in the Quran that had he wanted, that everybody on the planet would have been a believer. So you have to accept that not everybody's going to be a believer. And you have to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam. When he came to Medina, what did he say? He didn't say, Ya ayuha al-Muslimun. The first public address that the Messenger wasallam did to people in Medina was, Ya ayuha al-Nas. At'imu al-Ta'am, wa afshu al-Salam, wa sallu bil-Layli wa al-Nas wa niyam, tadkhulu al-Jannata bi salam. Oh people, everybody. Jews, Christians, pagans, everybody that's in Medina. I don't care who you are and what you are and what you believe in. Everybody together, feed the hungry, and spread peace, and pray at night while people are asleep, and you will enter paradise in peace. So you have to accept that Islam is not a religion that is seeking to make everybody a Muslim. You have to accept that belief is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you are commanded as believers to وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna and speak beautifully to people. Unless we engage with the larger community, at a more human level, instead of just all of these artificial events that we hold, which are great, it's great to invite them to the masjid, and, but Muslims are not in the masjid all the time. So it's good to bring them to your home, open up your homes, open up your stores, open up, just get everybody to come together. And like this sister that did in the States, a beautiful initiative with her business. She makes these um, uh, uh, organic, uh, fair trade uh, uh, energy bars. And what she did, and she was featured on Al Jazeera uh, Amer English, what she did was, for every bar that she sells, she donates a bar. For every energy bar that she sells, she donates one. And so she was featured because her business is growing, it's blowing up now, because of this act that she's doing. But more importantly, this is a sister in hijab that's starting a business, that's doing something for the greater community, and she's putting her best foot forward. So that's just a quick note about that. Now, what I wanted to cover in this khutbah today is something that I covered in the previous khutbah a few weeks ago, which confused some people. The last khutbah we gave here was about wisdom. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a blessing, a bounty, a favor upon the believers that He sent from amongst them a messenger. He recites to them his signs. And we explained before that ayat, ayah in the Quran, doesn't necessarily translate to verse. Ayah in Arabic means sign. And sign necessarily means that there is something that the sign has, and then there is something that the sign points to. So when you read the Quran, there is the immediate message that you get from the apparent, and then there is a greater, bigger message that you should look to. وَيُزَكِّهِمْ And purifies them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Purifies them in the sense that it's not enough for you to know your fiqh, to know your law. 
to do your rituals. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us on the tongue of Ibrahim alayhi salam, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ That on a day when nothing will benefit you, no wealth, no children, unless you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. There are plenty of people that pray a lot, and fast a lot, and stand up at night, and give charity. But if that is not translated into, an, if, into a change in their heart, if their heart has envy and animosity and fighting with everybody and cussing at everybody and cursing everything, and if that's the state of the heart, these are just outward actions. They're not going to benefit. You have to change the state of the heart. You have to polish your heart. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And this was the point that caused a little bit of confusion last time. That the Messenger وسلم, was sent to us to teach us الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ and the Mufassirun, Imam Al-Qurtubi, Imam Al-Razi, Fakhradin Al-Razi and others mentioned that Al-Kitab is referring to the outward acts of worship. Zawahir al-Shari'ah. That you know how to pray, you know how to fast, you know how to do your wudu, your ghusl, all of these things, these are Zawahir al-Shari'ah. Well, hikmah is the wisdom. As Al-Razi mentions, وَأَسْرَارُهَا وَعِلَلُهَا It's the secrets of the Shari'ah. It's what all of this is about. Why are we doing these things? Now we live in a time that Many people, I get messages all the time, Facebook, Twitter, emails, from especially young people in university going through a crisis of faith. Now this is inevitable, especially for the elders here raising kids. All of these kids, as they go through the education system, they're going to have a crisis of faith, many of them. And the reason for it is because many of those who do go through this crisis of faith is because they're not, they know they're Muslim, but they don't know why they're Muslim. A lot of the focus has been on things that are very simple to teach. Get me a convert when, in an hour. This person will know how to pray, will know how to fast, will know how to do the ritual purifications, the ghusl, the wudu, within an hour. It's not that hard. Islam is a very simple religion. But we focus on it so much and we insist on these things and talking about them so much that we neglect, okay, what's the point behind all of this? Okay, so I'm doing all of these things. It's not enough for you to just say, because Allah said so. Well, of course, that goes without saying. You didn't bring anything new. Allah said so. I get it. But what else? Now, we all know that the Messenger وسلم, from the seerah, we were told what? That he's a sadiq al amin He is the truthful. He is the trustworthy. We know that. We've been told that several times. But since we're not physically interacting with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this, we're not actually seeing him in action. To us, this is abstract knowledge. We haven't experienced what it means for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be a Sadiq al amin We know it, we believe it, but we haven't experienced it. How do you experience it? This is what Imam Fakhradin al-Razi mentions about what al-Hikmah is. And also Ibn al-Qayyim. When the Sharia, when Islam is applied, the way that it is to be applied in your daily life. We're not talking about taking over and making it like a societal thing. I'm talking just for you personally. Because Imam al-Ghazali wrote a book, al munqidh min al-Dalal. His book was Deliverance from, mis from Error or from Misguidance. It's translated, I recommend especially the university educated crowd, uh, people in the university to go and read that. Because he addresses a lot of things that are contemporary right now that are brought up in courses. And Imam al-Ghazali had his own crisis of faith. And he reflected on, okay, well, how do you know that a doctor, for example, is trustworthy? You look at the degrees on the wall, you see where they went and trained, you see all of these things, and you just believe it. Also, you apply what they tell you. So when you're sick, you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, do this, this, and that, take this medication, and you'll be well in five to seven days. And you do exactly what they said. Now, most of us haven't studied pharmacology. Most of us did not go to medical school. So most of us, despite your Googleizing and Yahooing and YouTubing, you will still do what the doctor says and then it will get better and you won't really know exactly what happened. You'll just accept it. Same thing with messengers. Imam al-Ghazali says not everybody is meant to be a messenger. These are doors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up for people. And one of the doors is the doors of prophecy. That somebody becomes a prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that bounty to that individual. They come to you with a sharia, a medical sharia, for your spiritual well-being. And Imam al-Ghazali says, you can't test, just like you can't, if you're not a doctor, you can't go and test the doctor. 
Why do we believe that Einstein was a genius? How many of us actually know what E equals MC squared really means? Why do you accept that Richard Feynman was an unbelievable genius in physics and theoretical physics? It's not because you did the math. Let's just be real. None of us here, most of us here, don't know how to start fuk al khat even. How to even start working with these equations. But we accept it because, first of all, all the scientists in that field say, that person is the real deal. Second of all, you experience the impact of Einstein's theories and Feynman's work in your day-to-day -day life. These iPhones and Androids and Internet and satellites and all of these things, they're all based on theories these geniuses, al jahabida in physics, have come up with. So you experience the impact of their work on your life and then you accept they must be geniuses. The same thing goes for religion. Imam al-Ghazali says, you have to take what the Messenger ﷺ came with and just do it. You don't test him and say like, I need to test and make sure that you're a messenger. Because that means you have to rise above him or be at least on equal footing with him so that you can test him and see, yeah, you're the real deal. It doesn't work that way. So, hikmah. We talked about hikmah last time. And hikmah, the best definition is that of Imam ibn al-Qayyim, in my opinion. Where he says, Al-hikmah hiya fi'lu ma yanbaghi, ala al wajhi ladhi yanbaghi, fi al waqti ladhi yanbaghi. That hikmah is to do the thing that is appropriate, in the manner that it is appropriate to do it in, at the appropriate time, in the appropriate context. That's what hikmah is. That's what wisdom is. Kitab is just, I know the rulings. Hikmah is, okay, how do I apply these rulings? In a way that I don't transgress. Because Imam Qayyim also mentions that the Sharia is founded upon Adil, justice, Rahma, mercy, masalih, benefits, and Hikmah, wisdom. Now, give you a case study because we're still in the abstract realm. How do I know? The way that we interact with the Sharia as Muslims is predominantly on the kitab level. We just look at it from the law. Now, if you want to get to somebody and show them that Islam, because we're passive, we're passive recipients of the Sharia. But the youth end up with a crisis of faith because they're active. They have a lot of energy and they want to, okay, so what does this mean? I want to take this Islam at, and make it relevant in my day-to-day -day life in some sort of way. That I take it and I make it so that I'm a Khalifa. A true Khalifa in the proper term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels. With qala rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels, I'm going to make a Khalifa on this planet. That means you're the caretakers of this planet. You're the vicegerents. You're the custodians. You're the stewards. That means there is an active role. That means you have a manual, your sharia, but you also have to exercise your intellect to some degree and look at the impact of some of the decisions you make on day-to-day -day life. A case study. We just came out of Ramadan. And Ramadan, one of the biggest things about it is we abstain from eating and drinking. What many of us don't pay attention to is the first sin that got Adam and Eve, alayhim salam, from the garden is what? Eating. You know, when you sit in a lot of Islamic lectures and stuff, they talk about sexual, this promiscuity, women, uh, the sufur, all of that stuff. But the primary reason that we came out of the garden was eating. It was not sexual gratification. It was not stealing. It was not any of these things. They're important. And they have a negative impact. But the reason we came out of paradise, that Adam and Eve السلام, were swayed by shaitan, he went to them through the route of, go eat from that tree that you were told not to eat from. So it's the food. Food has a great impact on your spiritual well-being. And you have a whole month of the year to abstain from it. And you have the rest of the year where you abstain from other types of food. Not all food is permissible. And some food is automatically impermissible until you make it permissible, as in the case of slaughtering. Otherwise, going to KFC and McDonald's and such, that's not permissible food. You have to actually go engage in the slaughter process. But is it enough? Because the slaughter process where you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, that makes it halal. So now you've satisfied the kitab. What about the hikmah? If this animal was abused throughout all of its existence, let's say that you go to a, an industrial level farming practice 
where these animals are confined in small little huts and, and abused and given the wrong food and they live in misery. And then you come as the Muslim person and saying, I'm going to make some halal meat now. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Legally, Islamically speaking, from a kitab perspective, that meat is halal. You're not sinning if you eat it. But big picture, are you getting closer to Allah doing that? You know, the Prophet ﷺ said that Islam is deen al-fitra. That Islam is the religion of the natural human inclination towards truth and purity and goodness. That's what Islam is. Now, if I were to show anybody a farm where animals are being abused day in and day out, and then I tell them, but look, mashallah, we say bismillah, Allah Akbar, now it's halal. Do you think that person is going to be satisfied now? Are you satisfied with that meat? It's not just the meat. Because we think that we've made it halal, we go into a bubble, we're okay. Let's just have our own farm, we're fine. Many of us shop for our groceries, and there's a lot of cheese lovers, as I understand. And milk. You've got to have your cereal. Many of us get our milk and cheese and butter from Walmart, Superstore, Safeway, Thrifty Foods, all of these major outlets. Did you know that that milk that you grab from the fridge, just like everybody does, that milk came from a cow. The natural lifespan of cows is 20 to 25 years. But cows that produce that milk, they live for about five to six years. And the reason they live for five to six years is first they have to be artificially impregnated. They're milked for 10 months out of the 12 months. And the impact that has on their body is so much that after five years, they literally collapse. They fall down. Then they get dragged on a tractor and thrown into the slaughterhouse. That milk also comes from the cow which gave birth to a calf. That calf, within a few hours, is taken away from its mother and taken into the veal industry. Now veal has a very pale color to it. Do you know how they get that pale color? Those calves are fed a low iron diet. So they're anemic their whole existence before they get sent to the slaughterhouse. So the calf, the veal industry, is dependent upon the dairy industry. And the dairy industry, when you go buy that milk, that came from an emotionally and physically abused cow. The cows usually cry out for a couple of weeks looking for their young one. Because it got kidnapped from it. And they get fed food that they normally don't eat because they have to fortify it. For what? For the sake of, they need to keep producing milk for 10 months of the year when we milk them. Now the Messenger وسلم, came one, night, one day and he passed by and there was a camel crying. He went to the camel and the camel spoke to him. It's a, it's a miracle of the Messenger وسلم. And then the Messenger وسلم, said, who owns this camel? A young man comes out and says, it's me, Ya Rasulullah. And he وسلم, was angry with him and rebuked him. And he said, the camel complained about the, 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 the impact of the work that you put on it. You overbear it with work. You do too much. You make it do too much. And it was complaining to me for your behavior, for how you're handling it. Now imagine, the question is, it's not, I'm not going to tell you it's haram for you to buy the milk and the cheese. Because the milk and the cheese and all of these things is derived from all of these things. And it's halal for you to buy. But knowing where they came from, knowing the life that these cows and goats and things that they have to go through. Do you honestly think that your messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to come and say give me some milk knowing the abuse that these animals have to go through give you another thing because some people say like oh halal is too hard halal meat is too hard when i go to milestones or cactus club or wherever i'm just going to buy some fish well there was an associated press report just a couple of months ago not even and in this associated press report they found that all of the fish that you eat all of the shrimp that you get is contaminated with fish and shrimp that is caught by slaves that are put in cages for 20 hours a day in Indonesia, off the coast of Indonesia. There's pictures online, there's videos online, you can see this. Grown men who were kidnapped from their homes, from their families, put into cages, put on boats and forced to work. And many of them end up committing suicide or they fall off and they die and nobody knows anything about them. And they try to trace it. Can you really, because they have ocean wise, can you really trace and make sure that the fish and the shrimp that you eat 
is not, doesn't have slave labor involved, and they said you can't. Because they found this fish at Safeway, Superstores, Costco, Milestones, Earls, all of them. No matter what they tell you. So now, this energy, this food that you're eating, can you honestly tell me, even if it's technically halal, because technically it is halal, is it ethically halal for you to eat? Are you getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by consuming this food? Many people wonder, I'm having a crisis of faith. I can't get up for subh in the morning. إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ وَلَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا When you get up to pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conduct your prayers, that is energy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure. And He wants only pure things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells you, Several verses. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا In the Qur'an, look throughout all of the verses that talk about eating. It's always linking halal and tayyib together. It's never just halal. It's halalan and tayyiban. You have to link the two of them together. So that's what it means to have something that could be halal shari'atan, haram haqiqatan. And this applies across the board. When you go buy shrimp, by the way, for every pound of shrimp that you buy, there is 20 pounds of baikil. Dolphins, turtles, other animals, sea creatures that get caught in the midst of it, 20 pounds for every pound. Get caught, when they get dis discarded, they're either dead or dying. 76% of the ocean is depleted. 90% um, of the tuna is gone. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman alam al-Quran khalaqa al-insan alamuhu al-bayan al-shamsu wal-qamaru al-husban wal-shajur al-sujan wal-samaa rafa'aha wa wada'a al-mizana alla tatghaw fi al-mizan. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ar-Rahman says, That He raised the heavens and He put down the balance. Do not transgress in the balance. The earth is running on a balance. But because of our industrial level of consumption of everything, we've destroyed the balance. Now, just to close off, when it comes to eating, most of us recognize or think that the sunnah of eating is... You ask most Muslims, well, a third for your food, a third for your drink, and a third for your air to breathe. That's the sunnah. That's not the sunnah. The Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a hadith, Sahih, ma mala ibn Adam wi'a'an sharra min batnihi. That the son of Adam did not fill a vessel more evil than the stomach. Hasbu ibn Adam luqaymat. It is sufficient for the son of Adam or the daughter of Adam few morsels of food. Just to keep your back straight so that you have enough energy to do your tasks, your daily tasks. You're supposed to be a people, we, all of us, we're supposed to be a people that we eat to live, but we've turned it into we live to eat. And then he said, فَإِن كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ If you absolutely cannot control yourself, you're a gluttonous person, you have no breaks. Then he says, a third for your food, a third for your drink, and a third for your air. He's reminding you, push the brakes, because you still need to breathe. You still need to have some water. You look at the diet of the Prophet ﷺ, how, how, how often, some people here that love their meat will hate me for this. But Umar ibn Khattab anhu, I have a special love affair with Umar ibn Khattab anhu because he وسلم, told us about him that had there been a messenger after him, it would have been Umar. Wow. He had wisdom. He warned. He said, in, uh, in, uh, Imam al-Bayhaqi relates this. He said, اللحم, Be weary of meat. For it has an intoxicating, addictive quality like that of wine. Like that of intoxicants. Like that of booze. Drinks, drugs. And in fact, you look at some of the current research, they've actually identified this. Areas involved in addiction get fired up when you eat meat. Now the Prophet Sallallahu we always like to say, oh, he liked the ketif al -shah. He loved to eat the, the shoulder of the lamb. That's the sunnah. Yeah, how often did he eat it? Was it every day? Goat. Was it every day? Aisha radiallahu anha said, had, the, had we wanted, لو أردنا أن نشبع لشبعنا. Had we wanted, we would have been satiated. They had the resources. You look at some of the biographies of the companions, they were multi, multi-millionaires. They had land, they had houses, they had all kinds of stuff. They weren't poor, but you wouldn't know it for the way they lived. Money was not in their heart. It was something that they utilized. 
She said, had we wanted, we would have been satiated. And she said, sometimes we'll go three months, smoke wouldn't come out of the house. It's not because the Prophet ﷺ was unable to gain access to meat. His diet was based on luqaymat. It was based on, and now it's being translated into a modern, what's wrong, five to six meals a day. That's not what luqaymat is. Luqaymat is just enough energy for you to keep your back straight. Not five to six times a day grazing like a cow. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ was eating like. His diet was a semi-vegetarian diet. So he would have meat once in a while. It was not a daily affair. So now, a lot of us, I need meat in my breakfast, I need meat in my lunch, I need meat in my dinner. And if I don't have meat, I'll create a big fuss. And if my wife doesn't cook me meat for me, subhanAllah, maybe she'll be divorced. That's the attitude that many of us are having today. That's what it means to have. And you look at this all over the place. The sharia ah is not abatha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just make the sharia ah just haphazardly, willy-nilly, eat this, don't eat that, do this, don't do that. Look at the Quran as a whole and you'll find that there is a program for you to maintain your job as a steward and your position as a khalifa for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to take care of your responsibilities on this planet the way that you're supposed to. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم